It is time to make network and security simpler and more flexible. Ariaka helps enterprises modernize, optimize, and transform their network and security experience with Ariaka Unified SASE as a service. The only solution that delivers performance, agility, simplicity, and security without trade-offs. Ariaka Unified SASE as a service is a purpose-built, cloud-based offering that securely connects users and applications anywhere in the world. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Ariaka, that's A-R-Y-A-K-A, to learn more. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. You're invited to InfoSec World 2024 at Disney's Coronado Springs Resort in Lake Buena Vista, Florida, from September 23rd through the 25th. Join top cybersecurity experts for this premier event. You can save 25% on your pass by using code ISW24-SW25 when you register at securityweekly.com forward slash infosecworld2024. Uh, don't miss out on this exclusive opportunity. Also, we now have Mr. Darwin Zalazar with us. How are you doing, Darwin? Howdy. Uh, doing pretty well. Uh, this pack past week has been a whirlwind uh, in our space, as, as you know, and as we'll cover in our next segment. Uh, but we're a couple of way, a couple of weeks away from Black Hat here, and so just uh, heads down, getting ready for that. Uh, and super excited to um, speak with our guest today, uh, Mr. Edward Wu. So I'll pop it back to you, Adrian. But yeah, super happy to be here as always. Awesome. Uh, as Darwin mentioned, Edward Wu is with us uh, today to continue our discussion about evolving the SOC with new technologies, uh, specifically AI. Uh, Edward is the founder and CEO of DropZone AI. He holds over 30 patents in ML and cybersecurity and is a contributor to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Edward previously worked on attack detection using wire data at ExtraHop Networks, who we know well and has been a sponsor in the past. Welcome to the show, Edward. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we just ended an interview with uh, with Greg Notch uh, from Expel, uh, who's the CISO over there at Expel, and Expel does uh, a lot of uh, outsourcing, SOC, uh, MDR work, uh, things like that. You know, so obviously this is something that's top of mind for them. Uh, you know, both for their own organization and for how they serve clients uh, as a managed services uh, company. Um, so yeah, it's a in very interesting talking about like you know specifically um you know what the use cases are here you know where we can use different kinds of ai you know because uh he he said they find uh, they get a lot of good use out of machine learning uh you know as well you know generative ai is a bit bit smaller uh in terms of the the use cases where they can use it but also uh you know we thought it was interesting we we're talking about uh, potential custom LLMs for cybersecurity use cases and where maybe some of that training data comes from and, and how we how we generate uh, enough data for that to happen. So um, so let, let's start with what attracted you to the space, you know, coming from extra hop. Um, you know, what, was it obvious that the SOC was suffering and, and needed some help here? What was you know, what, what made you jump to this uh, particular area to found a company? Yeah, it's definitely a very interesting topic. So I spent over eight years at Actual Hub Networks where I built its AI ML and detection product from scratch. So during that time, really got to work with a lot of different SOCs. And, and you know, over time came to the discovery or the realization that most SOCs already have too many detection products um, and they have too many alerts that they are capable of processing. Um, so this is where kind of looking at, you know, the entire security operation data pipeline from like data gathering, you know, telemetry storing, ETLs to detection, to investigation and to response. If we were to zoom out, it's pretty clear that investigation is sing the single biggest bottleneck within security operation today. Reason being all these stages upstream of investigation which are like initial data gathering and detection is practically 100% automated. But investigation itself at this point for most teams, as well as even service providers are like over 90% plus manual. So you have like a complete automated detection phase generating, you know, oftentimes thousands of alerts into, you know, a small team of human analysts who have to manually investigate each and every one of them. 
Yeah, nobody should be manually typing in who is who is or NS lookup uh, or dig or anything like that these days, right? Like we we should have more. Is that what a lot of it is? Is just pulling in context, putting together, uh, you know, going out and gathering all the context they need, you know, understanding, you know, the 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 attack source, uh, you know, think things like that, gathering that stuff maybe from other systems as well. Yeah, exactly. So if we were to, you know, zoom in to what a human analyst actually does during an investigation, it's kind of very similar to being a detective, but for the cyberspace, right? So being a detective, there's a certain component of, you can say, hypothesis proposing logical deduction. And then there's components of evidence gathering, right? No detective can you know, determine or get to the true nature of a case by sitting in front of a computer and just looking at the case notes, right? They need to go into the field, gather evidence, whether it's DNA or interviewing people or looking at the things. And that's very similar to a human security analyst. So in our mind, it's like two components. One is the logical deduction reasoning. Uh, and then the other component is actual interaction with a variety of different IT and security systems in order to pull in relevant metadata that can help to shine a light on what the alert is actually about. Copy. And it sounds like uh, for the past several decades, uh, we've had the technological advancements to kind of streamline and automate a lot of the detection processes. Uh, we're, we're very mature on that part, but what you're saying is on the right-hand side, once an alert is triggered in tri triaging and investigating the alert, uh, not only are analysts overburdened, but also uh, they may be underskilled. Like there's a lot of um, small to medium-sized enterprises that don't have the um, staffing capabilities that the larger enterprises do. And so how does your solution come through and help solve that problem, say from um, and, and also, how are you thinking about the problem when it comes to after an alert is triggered, uh, how does drop zone co come in and make the life of an analyst uh, easier? Yeah, so um, to, to answer the first question, I would say ultimately at drop zone, we are leveraging generative AI advancements as a technical catalyst to bring a step function in the automation within alert investigations. So with like what we have shown you know, and um, seeing from our early adopters and design partners is by leveraging generative AI, we are able to automate over 90% of the manual analysis that's involved with a typical tier one, you know, alert investigation. So what that means is essentially with this step function increase in the level of automation and thanks to the fact that, you know, electro electricity and silicon automate uh, ultimately is a lot more cost effective um, and consistent um, than typical human labor, we envision a future where we can allow small teams with very limited budgets to operate as if they have an additional team of 10 expert security analysts who are working 24 seven. What are some of the pitfalls that you're that you're seeing right now? Is it when it comes to writing these algorithms and fitting into analysts' daily workflows? Because it seems like, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, but security people are traditionally pretty skeptical of new processes. So, so talk about what you're seeing. Obviously, your and your teams are on the the forefront, but what are you seeing in the marketplace in the general enterprise? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I would say it's probably a billion dollar question at this moment. It's uh, it's undeniable, you know, for everybody who has played with ChatGPT is like, hey, this technology has something here, right? Like there's some spark of, you can say intelligence or automation that if harvested and used correctly can automate stuff. Um, the, the billion dollar question is, you know, what form or shape a specific product or a product should take in order to take full advantage of both the technology as well as you know the business opportunity. So mm -hmm. for us at Drop Zone, our philosophy is um, within alert investigation, there is this pretty well defined boundaries of what a typical human tier one security analyst should do, which is you know they take security alerts as input, they generate perform some sort of analysis and then ultimately determine whether the alert 
whether each alert is escalation worthy or not. So that's kind of a fairly well defined, you can say like a job function or a task. So at drop zone, you know, we are placing our bets on building an AI system that's kind of like a drop in substitution or replacement for a human tier one security analyst. And this is where like we have built a system that have the same set of boundaries, right? Our system takes security alerts as input, it autonomously generate detailed investigation reports with recommended conclusions as output. Um, so our, our view is by doing that, we allow existing human defenders to up level to tier two and tier three so they can focus on only the real threats as well as projects that, you know, and part of the detection and response that truly require human level intelligence. And what are some of the skills that you're looking for or, or that someone would need? Um, because we know that SOCs are understaffed, overworked, but what are some of the skills that if somebody wanted to get into this line of work, they would need? Because it changes a little bit, not just going from a tier one to a tier two analyst, but also using LLMs, interpreting them correctly, understanding them and, and using the data. Yeah, um, I would say there is definitely a changing skill. Um, I definitely envision the future where folks will, you know, should not need to memorize how to write an LDAP search query against Active Directory, how to, you know, what are the sequence of button clicks you need to do within CrowdStrike to, to see the process tree information, you know, about a specific, you know, potential, potentially malicious executable. Like what I envision is the level of skill requirement on these technical or product specific nuances will decrease. However, the requirement for you know having a high level understanding of, of, of different components of security operation, have a good understanding of what the business actually needs and how the business application works will be more important. And this kind of transformation within the skill requirement, I would say is actually very similar to what Excel did to accounting. Like before Excel, a majority of the accounting is about number crunching, right? You have bookkeepers who like crunch numbers using calculators. Um, that's kind of majority of that. But nowadays, most of the you know financial analysts or modelers, they don't need to you know know how to perform arithmetic in their head or even know how to use a calculator, right? They just write equations in Excel spreadsheets, and when they added the number, all the other cells will update automatically. So this kind of up leveling where the necessity of nuances and you know uninteresting details will be decreased, but higher level you know within security you know in accounting the higher level stuff of financial modeling right like forecasting within cybersecurity the higher level stuff is you know tier two tier three analysis detection engineering incident response proactive security projects are going to get more you know attention. And Edward, um, so generative AI is very good. It excels at s certain functions, but it uh, kind of lags behind in other functions. So like in pattern matching and in converting natural language to a query per se, uh, Gen AI is very good, but maybe in arithmetic, it may lag behind. What are uh, some of those areas where you've seen Gen AI like truly show its colors in, in um, Excel? Yeah, um, I would say a couple of different things. Um, gen in general, any type of summarization, I would say general uh, gen, gen AI is tremendous at. Like there is nothing on the planet that can go through JSON blobs or text, you know, a, a large body of text as quick, quickly and efficiently as large language models. Um, they are also pretty good, I would say, in general um, with generation. So whether that's writing small scripts or, you know, writing like SQL queries under different constraints, I would say they are pretty good there. You're right, by itself, Gen AI or large language models are not good at arithmetic. Uh, but at the same time, I could argue that um, they can be made much better at arithmetic if you give them a Python interpreter. So instead of asking them, you know, which one is larger, you know, right? 9.9 .9 versus 9.11, which I think has been a, a common test people have been, 
you know, using to evaluate intelligence, instead of, you know, asking the models that directly, uh, what's more effective is actually asking the model to write a Python program or a Python, you know, script that compares 9.9 .9 to 9.11 and, you know, use Python to kind of respond, you know, true or false. So this is yeah. where, like, G sometimes Gen AI or the models themselves are not, you know, the answer to every single problem, but the models combined with specialized tools like calculator, like Google, you know, like a dictionary or a book, that's where they kind of become very effective. And that's why you, you might have heard a lot of mentions of things like, you know, tool invocation, um, things like, you know, RAG, retrieval augmented generation. Right. And, and RAG has really helped uh, decrease the risk of hallucination and kind of keep these models grounded. So we have seen a, a ton of improvements in these areas that were initially areas of concern and, and cause for skepticism in the security space. So uh, I had another question around, like, how have you, Katie had previously alluded to the skepticism in the security space. I would say that uh, we, we are some of the most skeptical skeptical people in the world because we we have to be paranoid to do our jobs uh it's a requirement and so how have you seen over time since founding the company kind of the skepticism um change in, in our space uh are you have you seen things improve uh what's the overall consensus there yeah <laughs> that's definitely an active i would say ongoing uh, you know challenge we're, we're working through um I, I would say there's a couple components to this one is um, like at this moment with regards to the technology, um, I think a lot of people still have doubts. Um, on, hey, I can see, you know, chat GPT sometimes being very brilliant, but it doesn't do that really consistently. And, you know, how do I trust your AI security analyst? Um, it is a very common ask we get all the time when we chat with, you know, security teams. Um, and for us, like we have been focused on a couple of areas, um, but first and foremost, and that actually not only applies to, I would say, Gen AI-based cybersecurity tools, it actually applies to all security products, right? Um, as you might know, traditionally, security products are incredibly difficult to evaluate. Like if you have EDRs, how do you prove, you know, CrowdStrike is better than Defender, better than Sentinel-1? Like nobody on the planet can really prove that. Um, and this is where, like traditionally, a lot of the security marketing is based on promises, right? By us, we will detect everything, we will stop breaches. Like one thing I would say at Drop Zone, we have been doing a lot is instead of making promises, actually making our technology directly visible to prospects. So for example, on our website, we have a public ungated test drive of our technology where anybody on the internet can forward emails to our AI security analyst and challenge our AI security analyst and see what its analysis, you know, looks like. Uh, so that's kind of one example. Uh, we have also recorded over like 20 different demos showing how our AI analysts work in different real world scenarios. So I would say ultimately, like how do you trust an AI security analyst is actually not that different on how you build trust against a human security analyst, right? You know, obviously seeing how the, how the human or AI work in the real world ultimately is the best test testing stone on its capabilities. Yeah, repetition, keeping a close eye on it. Yeah, it's just going to take time, right? So then that that begs the question. You know, you're talking about the difficulty of of uh, testing products. You know, so in, in the POC process, you know, um, that that's always a challenge for a security product, right? Um, and uh, also, I'm curious, you know, for, for the product, uh, I, I've not come up with a good term for this. I Sometimes I call it the cost of uh, customization or the customization tax or the product acquisition cost. Uh, you know, what's the level of effort to take something like what you're building and to make it work for in, in the customer's environment? Uh, you know, knowing that, you know, in some organizations, uh, something that's a red flag may be totally fine in another one because things are weird there and they have, you know, weird network protocols and, and things happening there. Um, you know, like like I know some security products use, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 DNS uh, for 
command and control of the product basically. So it looks like a C2 mechanism, but but really that that's just how the product works. They they do it so that you don't have to poke a hole in a firewall, right? So how, how much how much effort is there uh, on the customer's part to integrate this and make this work? Do you, do they need people who are prompt engineers who are uh, comfortable enough with LLMs to to make this this fit in and work? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I would say our product is designed in a way that's kind of you know built by the expert but for the mortals. Uh, so we have built our system in a way where the deployment friction is as low as you know as possible. For example, our technology is a SaaS, so it kind of deploys essentially by making API integrations with existing security products in the environment. A lot of times it means essentially 10 minutes of clicking around creating service accounts, for example, in Microsoft or Google or AWS, and then copy pasting credentials to our product. The deployment most of the time takes less than 30 minutes. Um, so that's kind of on the deployment side. And then you talk about this customization. Like you are right, one big challenge with most security products is their inability to understand the environment. Uh, what's nice about our product is our product is not only pre-trained, so you don't, you know, on day one, it already knows how to use different products and investigate different alerts, but it's, it has multiple mechanisms built in place for it to automatically adapt to each specific environment. Like one concrete example is we have a capability called organizational context where when our system is connected with an existing case management system that the security teams have been using, our system will actually programmatically crawl through every single existing cases, mm. tickets, and comments and extract nuggets of organizational policies and preferences out of those. So it will automatically backfill essentially a knowledge base or a database of these tips and tricks that most security analysts pick up over time as they work in the organization, but keeping their head. Right. So you said it's fine tuning data, something like that. Uh, I will conceptually, it's kind of fine tuning, but maybe another way I would say, another way to think about it will be like programmatically generating a gigantic sticker notes, <laughs> you know, uh, that captures a large number of bullet points that a senior analyst will want to pass on to a new hire. How much handholding would a new customer get? Because obviously this is a this is a change for a lot of teams. So do you have a professional services component to to the to the offering? Can people call in any time? Do they get a year, two years, unlimited? Um, because I see as the technology evolves some people will naturally evolve with it but but your team is going to be pushing the limits on what it can do so it might be a little more entrenched so how does that work yeah so for us we do have a professional service component uh, for example you know sometimes when our customers deploy our ai security analyst they might want to have additional downstream automation where for example some of our customers have very small security teams so they want our AI analyst to be the tier one on weekends and evenings and automatically trigger, for example, a pager duty page when certain criteria are met on, a give, on the investigations. So this is where we do have professional service team who, you know, build up some of the downstream, you know, connectors, or you can say like the middleware so that our system programmatically invokes, whether it's downstream response automation, or paging that the customer wants to use. All right. Yeah. So so again, going back to you know the the core of where this this product is helping. Um, you know, you you say you know it, it it's processing alerts. You know, I think is a, the the terminology uh, you use. So uh, when you say that, help help me understand maybe with an example or something like that. Uh, it, it, exactly what that means. Like, like to to what extent, um, uh, you know, is, is it just uh, basically pulling everything together into uh, into a like a cohesive summarized report, 
Uh, you know, is it, uh, are you going to the point of it being able to take actions if there's enough repetition and people are comfortable with how it's handling these, these alerts? Uh, so how far is that going when you say process alerts? And, and again, maybe an example uh, would make it more clear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, see, see, high level answer um, is we, our system is doing um the same set of analysis that a typical tier one human security analyst would have done for each alert. So to give you a concrete example, let's say there is a log for shell exploitation alert from the Palo Alto firewall, right? Like most human analysts will need to go through a couple of different steps, uh, ranging from, you know, looking at who owns the target server, what is the reputation of the external attacker, sometimes pull the PCAPs from the firewall, open up the PCAPs within Wireshark to look for the actual payload to ensure that, hey, a log for shell exploitation indeed happened. And if the, you know, there are indicators of JNDI headers, for example, within the PCAPs, then maybe look at network logs or endpoint logs on the target server to see, hey, are there outbound connections, you know, outbound LDAP connections to the attacker, which um, is actually, you know, if you remember a hallmark indicator of a successful exploitation. If there is a successful exploitation, what else did the attacker do on the endpoint? Again, looking to endpoint logs. So these are all some, you know, uh, examples of for a given alert, you know, the sequence of enrichment data pooling analysis, a typical tier one human analyst would have done. And in our case, we have built a system that automate all of these steps where at the end, um, the, the team gets a detailed investigation report that highlights the steps our system have performed, a high-level summary of what we found, a recommended conclusion. Hey, in this case, we found the exploitation did happen. The exploitation was successful. We even saw some new Python processes started on the target. Something definitely is going on here. We should escalate this. Um, so these are you know, all the things we have built our system to automatically perform. Yeah, I was just going to say, since, since the advent of generative AI, kind of like when things really started blowing up, uh, I would say in December of 2022, uh, January 2023, when we really started seeing implementation of generative AI for security use cases really start taking off, uh, there have been several uh, SOC augmentation um, startups that have, you know, emerged from stealth and, and are competing in a similar space as you. Um, how are you thinking about the competition and differentiating yourself from these products? Obviously, you guys were kind of first to market, uh, which is something that I noticed. And so time is on your side. You've recently raised your Series A uh, in April. Uh, I think it was 16, 17 million. So you have the resources on your side. Uh, but, but how are you thinking about things? And if you could shine a light a little bit on the uh, roadmap for the product, uh, what are what are maybe some things you guys are thinking about that would be awesome as well? Yeah, so in terms of roadmap, I would say a big the biggest thing is continuously um, adding additional integrations with different security products. You know, no human analyst will decline a job offer if they happen to not know how to use specific products, right? But for our AI security analysts, in order for us to be effective, we need to be able to work with different security systems that our customers are using. So that's kind of, I would say, one big area. Um, orthogonal to that, you know, continuously improving the analytical quality of our, um, you know, uh, that our systems are performing is another key key area. Um, in a lot of the early engagements we have had, um, our customers actually build a spreadsheet where one column is what DropZone has found, what the other column is what their existing human analysts have found. And we have been you know, comparing and contrasting a little bit. Um, and I would say we have been proven to be as effective, if not slightly better, for some of these early engagements already. But continuously, we want to you know, con invest in this area so we, we get to a place where our AI security analyst is definitively better you know, than an average human tier one security analyst on, you know, every single combination of security products and on the common alert types. So that's kind of continuously to be our primary focus on the engineering front. And then in terms of differentiation, you're right, you know, 
Gen, applying Gen AI for SOC automation to some extent is a glaringly obvious use case, um, and and you know and the business op opportunity is tremendous, right? If you look at the tool spending versus the tier one security analyst spending and the MSSP, you know, outsource spending, um, the, the, the market is gigantic. Uh, so it's not surprisingly we have seen you know in the last year many additional players start to emerge. Uh, from our perspective, um, I would say our biggest differentiation um, ultimately boils down to two things. Like we are building an AI agent that can replicate, you know, tier one human alert investigation work. Um, that's kind of a, actually quite similar in spirit to autonomous driving or, you know, um, autopilot. Um, and this is where if we look at autonomous driving system, ultimately, it boils down to two things. You need a lot of expertise and you need a lot of data. Um, and this is where we have, I think, really good strengths in both of these. Like we are the only vendor in our space with a public test drive as well as, um, so we have over 700 enterprises already playing with our technology. In addition to that, our AI analysts have already cumulatively performed close to 10,000 uh, man hours of alert investigations in production. So that allowed us to gather a lot of data. And then in terms of expertise, Adrian's pretty familiar with this, you know, uh, uh, like our DNA and most of our founding engineers came from Actual Hub Networks, where we built a, you know, arguably in our minds, the world's best network detection and response product, where we are using AI ML in production for many years, you know, processing petabytes of data, millions of devices every single day. So we are we have a lot of experience in building high volume, you know, production grade AI ML systems for cybersecurity. We didn't pick up AI, you know, last year. We didn't jump get into security, you know, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. So I think this combination of expertise of the team as well as the data is going to ultimately make drop zone successful. Awesome. I'm sold. Where do I sign up? <laughs> yeah, check us out at dropzone.ai. Um, and like I said, we, we are the only vendor in the space with a public test oh, nice. drive. So, uh, you know, if you are interested, definitely give us a shot. Um, and, and, you know, feel free to challenge our uh, AI security analyst with a couple of tricky emails. We have seen a couple of people actually challenging us with emails where there's no text whatsoever. It's actually just a single image with a lot of text embedded. Uh, and our system was actually able to process that thanks to you know some of the vision capabilities of the large language models. Very nice. Yeah, multi multimodal, right? Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, a really interested to see where this goes. Uh, we're going to be following it closely. And uh, yeah, m maybe, uh, you know, 12, 18 months, we have you come back on and and see where see where you are then but uh edward uh thank you so much for joining us in enterprise security weekly today yeah absolutely all right we'll be right back in a few moments with the weekly enterprise news